Hello. Every year around this time, ROTC cadets are given full ride Army ROTC scholarships. And at around this same time, there's always a chorus of enlisted people going around to those cadets, telling them that they should turn down their full ride scholarship and enlist instead. And I do admit that there are some advantages to green to gold, and this video is in no way meant to disrespect the people who did green to gold appropriately. But if you're gonna go around trying to lure cadets away from their full ride Army ROTC scholarships, you might wanna go ahead and mention that enlistment is a high risk proposition that might not work out for all ROTC cadets. Basically, if you complete an enlistment and do it well, and then go to be an officer, it'll give you a significant leg up over the other people who just came straight out of college. However, if you aren't really sure if you even wanna be enlisted, kind of sign a contract that you're not really committed to, and then decide you don't even wanna do it, well, when you graduate from college, even if your GPA and PT score is higher than the other civilians who are applying for the commissioning board, the fact that you used to be enlisted has to be evaluated and you cannot deny that you were enlisted on the form. So if you screw up your enlistment, it'll actually knock you da down a bit in comparison to the other candidates, even if you're ahead of them on PT and grades, and quite frankly, know a lot more how to manage a platoon than they do. Now that sounds like it can't even be true to some people, but it is, and there's a reason why the Army has to do that. It's about public image and administrative control. Basically, every time a person signs a contract, that's kind of like moving a piece on their army chessboard. And the one rule the army has is that you cannot reset your pieces back to square one and just play the game all over again like you're a brand new candidate. If you move even one piece, you have to stick with it for the rest of your life. If that one piece you moved was part of that like three move checkmate thing that people invented, well, I'm sorry you got checkmated in three moves, but no one can reset your chessboard to square one and just let you play a brand new game because like half the army kind of has mistakes on their chessboard that they don't like. And if word got out that even one person was allowed to reset their pieces, back to start game and just start brand new, then they'd have administrative overload of everyone saying, hey, I don't like my chessboard and want to start over too. So that's the reason why in some cases the army has to throw away candidates who could even outperform other candidates is just because they have to maintain certain appearances. Another thing you have to consider if you go the green to gold route is time. If your goal is to be a four-star general, which was my goal, you can still do it and one person has. However, time, whether it's in army, out of army, whatever else, time is time and you just get older over time no matter what. And so if you do green to gold, that's a lot of years that kind of get knocked out and so when you get to officer, you really need to move faster if you still want to make 010 before you age out of the game. And this video is actually being sent out at the 20 year point after my initial enlistment, which I guess means I'm officially aged out of the running. You know, the 2006 Ford Ranger was an extremely marketable truck in 2006, but selling a used 2006 Ford Ranger in 2022 is an arduous task, 
And ironically, I got into that position at the hands of a used car salesman. Now, when most people go into any kind of prior enlisted situation as an officer, their primary goal behind the enlistment was to in some way get more respect. In my case, that wasn't actually the goal at all. My career goal coming out of high school was to be considered the most creative and cunning military strategist who ever lived. My goal was to go straight in as an officer, and I didn't really care what my enlisted had to say about me as long as I went down in the history books as the smartest military strategist who ever lived. But I enlisted by accident because I actually don't know how to read more than three paragraphs in one sitting. And I kind of cheated my way through high school and then didn't read my contract. The program I signed up for was something called the Simultaneous Membership Program through the National Guard. And the person who recruited me into it was a former used car salesman who changed his career path to National Guard recruiter in search of greater economic reward. In summary, what the SMP program offers is that while you're still an ROTC cadet, you can come to the armory once a month and shadow a platoon leader, and it kind of looks good going in. And so it was almost the exact same budget as the Army ROTC scholarship that I already had. So when he first laid out the program, I was a little on the fence about it because I wasn't sure how much value the program had to offer. After he gave his spiel, when I was still feeling a little on the fence about it, he hit me with a curveball. And this is the thing you gotta know about used car salesmen. They are cunning strategists too. They just look at maps in a different way than you do. Like I kind of have a mild form of autism where I'm a spatial analysis genius. So I spent most of my childhood going through different military books and like doing really in-depth analysis on the diagrams that showed troop movements and procedures and stuff like that. But I really hadn't developed any defenses for used car salesmen pitches because I didn't think them militarily relevant, but they really, really were. So the used car salesman was like, I get the impression that you're a bit of a tough guy. And I was like, yeah, my career goal is to be an 18 alpha when I grow up. And he's all like, well, you know what I think the biggest problem in the Army is? We have all of these officers making our decisions, and none of them can handle the real enlisted training at Fort Benning. And so that was his final sales pitch that pushed it over. I didn't actually bother to study the careers of other successful officers. I only did in-depth analysis of diagrams and military equipment and stuff like that. So when he told me that, I actually thought that no other officer in the history of the Army had ever completed the enlisted basic training. So I was like, all right, I'll bust this out just to prove that we could do this if we wanted to. So I listened to his summary, and when he brought out the enlisted contract, he told me to think of it more as a permission form to go to a cool summer camp than a real contract, because I was only going to go to the summer camp, then I was going to do a grand total of 16 drill weekends wearing PFC rank, then I was going to do 16 more drill weekends wearing a cadet, 
And then after that, I was supposed to commission on active duty and move on with my career. And as far as I understood, that was all that was involved with the agreement and there was nothing else involved with the package. Now, the contract we had was actually a hundred pages long, but I don't read, so I was just like, all right, whatever, I'll just listen to your verbal summary and sign real quick. I don't think there's anything that the Cub Scouts do on the weekend that an 18 Alpha candidate is really going to find too hard. And at least that part is true, but what I didn't realize is that the contract that I was signing didn't even reference the fact that I was an ROTC cadet anywhere within the 100 pages. It was actually exactly identical to the enlisted contract everyone else had, but if my ROTC commander wanted to switch me to a cadet at the sophomore year, or junior year, I was allowed to do that. And so after I signed the form, I sat around MEPS for a really long time. And then this old guy who does paperwork at MEPS came and talked to me. And he was all like, I heard that you signed a hundred page contract and never read it. And I was like, yeah. And then he was like, since this could affect so much of your future, I just want to know why you wouldn't take a half hour out of your day to read the contract. And you see, at the time I was joining ROTC, it was actually illegal to be dyslexic and doing ROTC. It was a medically disqualifying condition. So that forced me to lie to the army so that I could enroll in ROTC. And the thing about the contract is for me to have actually read all 100 pages of my enlistment contract with my disorder, I would have had to basically read three paragraphs, took a two hour or three hour break, read three more paragraphs, and just kept going for what might have been two whole weeks just to read my entire enlisted contract. And I was more concerned about the army finding out that I was lying about being dyslexic than I was about whatever I might have to do for 16 weekends. So the guy could have said things that captured my attention more like, hey, this contract might entail more of your time than 16 weekends. Are you aware of that? But he didn't say. He said that there might be things I wanted to know, but he wouldn't even allude to what they were and just told me to read it. So if he thought that a half hour is how long it takes a normal college student to read a 100-page contract, well, I just went into a room and timed my watch for half an hour and then came back out and told him I read it and I was fine with it and left MEPS. Word to the wise, dyslexia is no longer a disqualifying condition for ROTC cadets. And if you need to hear your contract spoken out loud to you, ask for an electronic copy that you can put in your computer and play back on a headset. That's allowed these days. But bottom line, lying about the fact that you can't read is not nearly as significant as signing a contract you have no intention of honoring. And so if it comes down to a choice between the two, don't ever let not reading a contract get you. So then I went to Fort Benning and Fort Benning isn't really my complaint, but one thing I did notice while I was there is if the enlisted want to brag that their 11 Bravo school is so hard that the officers can't hang, they might be better off not inviting any of the officers to show up there. Uh, for the most part, I thought Infantry Basic and AIT was extremely easy. Uh, I didn't like the fact that they kind of 
treated me like a peasant because aristocrats get more naturally offended by that behavior. But other than that, I loved the ruck marching. I loved the shooting. Fort Benning was kind of fun. I just didn't want to sell my entire nobility in exchange for a peasant dinner roll. I also found out that like a hundred thousand other officers had already done this course before me. And if I had been told that information, I wouldn't have bothered repeating the experiment. But Fort Benning was kind of fun with the moving pop-up ranges and whatnot. Now, after Benning, I saw my first National Guard drill, and I wasn't really that impressed, but I had signed for 16 weekends, so I was just gonna go ahead and knock that out. It only really became a problem when the Army wanted me to be a private first class for a year and a half because the verbal contract that I made with my used car salesman made it abundantly clear that I am not a real enlisted person. I am an ROTC cadet who's just kind of starting his trade off buffet with the peasant dinner roll, but I don't really want any long-term loyalty or attachment to this National Guard organization. I said that point blank to my recruiter and he just said, yeah, that's pretty much the way all the SMP cadets think. It's perfectly fine. It'll only be 32 days of enlistment. So I went on a deployment and my entire full-time job for that year was just to sit in a tower and stare at sand. And this was extremely depressing to me. Like we have an all volunteer army and that's something to be proud of. 50 years ago, people thought an all volunteer army wasn't possible. But we still have the problem of people who technically volunteered to serve who are serving in a capacity they really hate. And I think getting the right people serving in the capacity that they want to serve would do more value for an all volunteer army than what we do now. But there are large voices within the army that say an army without bullshit cannot stand. And you know, even if we get the right people in the right hot spot, don't worry there will still be enough bullshit left in the army to go around if that's people's concerns. So, I mean, I just thought that having a person with a 178 IQ be a tower guard was a waste of military resources. But if the problem that the army was articulating that there are just too many towers and not enough people to guard them, that's not true. There are actually lots of people who would enjoy pulling tower guard and some of them even walk into recruiters offices and get turned away for various reasons. But when I came back from the deployment, I had changed in a lot of ways. I just had low morale and didn't think of the army the same way I had at the time that I joined. Uh, and that's an important thing to know that of the people who turned down their scholarships to do enlistment, not very many of them are actually getting commissioned. So statistically, for the people who go straight into active duty enlistment out of 18 because they want the full green to gold, less than half of the one who enlisted with that stated intention actually make it all the way to OCS. Now, for the program I was on, SMP, uh, about 95% of the cadets who join that program actually do wind up commissioning on active duty. But so far, not a single person who signed up for SMP and got sent on an enlisted deployment has come back, finished ROTC, and commissioned on active duty. There are a lot of different reasons why that plays out, but typically it's like 
SMP cadet who was once considered the most high speed active duty officer candidate, went on deployment, came back, went through a phase where they didn't even want to do the military, then eventually had a change of heart and commissioned in the National Guard a few years later, which is still kind of sad in a way, considering that used to be the most high speed active duty candidate on the market. So the real thing that killed my officer career technically wasn't the deployment. What it actually was, was changing my major. My first two years of Army ROTC, I was a history major. And my reasoning for that was I wanted to put 90% of my mental energy into being the most high speed Army ROTC cadet that I could possibly be. And I wanted to use the remaining 10% of my life energy to just bust out one of those degree things because technically an officer is supposed to have one. And majoring in history is a grand strategic vision that allows you to do that, that a lot of other ROTC cadets have already figured out. However, when I came back from deployment, I had a change of heart. Look, when I was three years old, I took the IQ test and I had the highest score in the spatial analysis department of any three-year-old who had ever taken the IQ test up until the year 1986. What actually happened is I completed all the puzzles the proctor bought with them and he said he had harder ones for the adult test, but he didn't bring them with him because they had never seen a three-year-old go that far before. On that same day, I also scored below average intelligence on a different section of the IQ test. So when I got back from overseas, I changed my major to civil engineering because I figured, you know, a spatial analysis genius probably should be working on an engineering degree. And I really wanted a backup plan at that point because it wasn't that I was completely put off from serving the army, but it had gotten to the point where like, you know, relying on them as your only mainstay is basically saying you want to rely on stupid for the rest of your life. And are you 100% sure that you don't want a backup plan? And that was the decision that led to me changing my major. So changing my major is what wound up doing me in for the SMP contract. I actually went back right after Egypt and finished my third year as an Army ROTC cadet. But I had changed my major to civil engineering, which basically made me a freshman all over again. And I was looking at being like a six year cadet. And this guy, Colonel Flutterkicks, who's basically the champion of the Army's tryhard camp, was this new commander who had come out of nowhere, who basically always presents the philosophy that you have to train every day. And if you even take one day off, that you'll forget everything you learned. And if that is true for him, that is basically admitting that you weren't born with very much natural ability in the first place. But that's not actually something the Army values that highly. So he basically told me, look, I don't want to let you finish ROTC and then just do academics for two years and then go to OBS. So you have to take a break from ROTC, finish college on your own, and when you are one year away from graduating, you will be allowed to come back to ROTC, knock out your fourth year, and then commission. And so he gave me the option of changing back to history and just getting the contract right then, but I didn't want to do it. I was committed to getting my engineering degree. So I walked away and lost all that.
So after leaving Army ROTC, I came into some obstacles that I wasn't even sure how I would pay for college. My National Guard contract was about to expire and I had no interest in re-upping. Actually, most of my nightmares from the National Guard are about monetary arguments I had with other members of the National Guard is they did pay for four years of college and they did pay for my airborne school and they held the fact that I didn't like them against me because they paid all that money. But the thing is, I already had four years of college covered by Army ROTC that I would have just had if they had left me alone. And also the airborne slot that I wound up getting from the National Guard, I found an Army ROTC cadet from the same unit at the exact same slot, and he scored one point lower than me on the PT test that assigned slots for airborne school. So actually, if I had just skipped the National Guard, I would have still got college paid for, and I would have wound up with airborne wings anyways, but the fact that they paid for them was something that they would just never shut up about. Without an Army ROTC contract, I couldn't afford out-of-state tuition at Virginia Tech. And so I had to move to a place where I could get in-state tuition. And that set my degree back even more because when you transfer your credits from one state to another, even if they're both public schools, you're going to lose more than half your credits and get set back even further. But after all this complaining that the National Guard basically stole my butter bar, I do have to admit that there was one point right at the end where they tried to hand me a butter bar for doing practically nothing. At the very end of my National Guard enlistment, I enrolled for the pre-OCS program, and I was there for about five months. And I was considered the most high-speed cadet in pre-OCS. And I was all signed up to go, and then they called me into a room and they said, look, Anderson, we're looking at your academics, and if we let you go to OCS, you're probably going to make captain before you even get your engineering degree, and that's a concern for us. So what we want you to do is enroll in this one school. Apparently my pre-OCS program, that was uh, one weekend a month, during the day when the OCS wasn't going on, that same building was technically a school. It was accredited, at least in the Army sense, that if you graduate, you get full rights to a butter bar. It was a six month long school, and even if you had no transfer credits, you could still get a full bachelor's degree in only six months. And every single person who enrolled in the school has passed. And the major that they offer is a bachelor of arts in baseball. And so they were basically like, look, Anderson, if you want to just take six months off, major in baseball, then you'll have one degree under your belt. You can serve the National Guard as an officer while you're working on your engineering degree, however long that takes, and that might be a better route. And I thought about it, but here's the thing. It's kind of like getting annexed by an organization and I just didn't want to be annexed. I started out as the most high speed cadet in the Virginia Tech Army ROTC department in 2002. And I was in line to go be an active duty officer. 
So what was the National Guard's interest in me? Why didn't they just say, all right, I'll just leave this scholarship cadet alone and go recruit someone else? The answer is they were like, hmm, that could be a good looking truck. And with all these other bumper stickers on the back of it, a National Guard bumper sticker would look really good on the back of this truck. And so they basically recruited me just to advertise for the National Guard. And then after going on a deployment with them, they're kind of like, well, you know how if people are looking to buy a car and they check the Carfax records and they're like, hey, this car might not be good. What if you find out that the negative reports in the Carfax are all coming from an organization that wants to purchase the vehicle and make it theirs. And that's basically what I was looking at with the National Guard. They were upset about the normal quality of officers they were getting. And the entire purpose of the SMP program is to annex a different demographic of officers into their organization. So I wound up leaving the National Guard I was out for six months. The entire six months that I was out, I got calls from the Army Reserve on a daily basis. And what they kept reminding me is although you finished your six, you're still technically in the Army for two more years on IRR. And they were basically trying to threaten me to get me to go back to IRR. But I was like, whatever. I'll take my chances. And um, they kept saying that like, if you don't join the reserves, you'll get deployed next month. And then next month came and next month came and I could tell they were just bullshitting me to try to get me to come back in. But the thing is, I really needed money. And if they were calling me every single day, then I assumed they at least wouldn't get hardline on me later about, hey, we gave you some money. So I came back and did another year and a half with the Army Reserves. And then, believe it or not, there are ways that you can be extended after eight years. They're a little bit more complicated. It's kind of private Army business that I won't get into unless people really want to know. But it wound up being a grand total of nine and a half years. So I wound up working on college for years even after I finished the Army. I changed my major a few more times and eventually wound up getting an even more advanced technical degree as a video game programming major. However, when I finally finished my degree, which I thought was the last obstacle to getting commissioned, it turned out there were a lot more. I actually spent the year after I graduated, I think in total I talked to over 30 different recruiters from all of the branches of service, and I couldn't get a deal with any of them. And there was always some BS excuse for why I couldn't get back in. The year that I finally graduated, was 2014 and in 2014 the army changed their tattoo policy traditionally going back since the dawn of the army as long as your tattoos didn't extend past a long sleeve they really couldn't get on you about tattoos unless they were super offensive which mine is not however in 2014 they changed the entire army tattoo policy to restrict one person from getting back into the army. And the reason they did that is kind of a complicated political matter. But basically, after I graduated, I was kind of mad at some NSA people. And I noticed that the commander of the NSA was a two to three star general. And so I decided my career goal would be to go back to the military, get the rank of two or three stars, and then conquer the NSA. And if that's your career goal, 
you probably shouldn't say that to another person out loud. But basically, in 2014, there were thousands of people who would have been better off coming back to the army at that time, who happened to have tattoos, and they were all turned away because one high profile candidate also had a tattoo and they really just wanted to remove that one high profile candidate from the running. When I was a kid, I was 13 years old and I decided that my career goal was to be a general when I grew up. It started with the game Command and Conquer. And I actually beat the game without taking a single casualty. And that was my claim to fame. Like, what do you want to be the most strategic genius at? Uh, battles that involve low casualties for my troops was my claim to fame. And if my attempt to reintegrate with the army is basically causing a few thousand casualties, well, that's just the most psychologically devastating thing that could happen for me. So as soon as I threw in the towel and gave up on trying to commission, the army immediately reset its two tattoo policy to something that made sense, and all the soldiers who needed to serve could serve as long as I removed myself from the equation. That is basically how it ended. And this video is coming out at exactly the 20 year mark after my initial enlistment. So in summary, prior enlisted army is something that the army is pushing really hard for their officers. And it has some advantages. If you think you're the right person, go ahead and do that role. But if you're going to go around learning the full ride ROTC cadets away from their scholarship with integrity, you can't sell them to turn down your scholarship without admitting that it's a high risk proposition and that you might not wind up commissioning at all. Now, if the person who's on the fence about this really is the next Mattis or the next Fox or the next whoever these famous green gold people will, he'll just ignore my video and go on with his career path. But if it's a person who's just like really kind of more in aristocratic thought patterns and really is just going to hate being enlisted, the fact that they can just say no thank you and go with a program that's better suited for them is a good thing because I really was rated the most high-speed Army ROTC cadet in the Virginia Tech Army ROTC department my freshman year and I didn't commission at all. If I had just signed my full ride Army ROTC cadet and told the enlisted recruiter no thank you, I would be earning 100000 a year right now and be in charge of a large number of people, whereas the enlistment actually caused my life to go really south, not commissioned at all, and I live with my parents at age 38. So this could be bad for some people, and if the right people do that, congratulations to them. I just want to build an army where people understand what they're signing up for and get the most out of their careers for their specific personality profiles. And I want to draw attention to the fact that actually prior enlistment isn't the best possible option for all ROTC cadets. Thank you for watching another episode of SS Street Fighter. Leave a like, leave a comment, and click subscribe to join the Street Fighter Army. I'd also like to send a thank you to my Patreon supporters, Charles and Nancy.